For four months, I've been waiting in vain for the North American media to pursue questions about the startling events of September 11th. Here's what I want to know. The multiple hijackings are unprecedented. The first occurs at 7.45 in the morning. It's a full hour before the first plane hits the World Trade Center. But it's an hour and 20 minutes, and after the second plane hits, that the president allegedly becomes informed. Think about that. Then he gives no orders. Why? He continues to listen to a student talk about her pet goat. Why? It's another 25 minutes until he makes a statement, even as Flight 77 is making a beeline for Washington, D.C. In the almost two hours of the total drama, not a single U.S. Air Force interceptor turns a wheel until it's too late. Why? Was it total incompetence on the part of air crews trained and equipped to scramble in minutes? Well, unlike the U.S. Air Force, I'll cut to the chase. Simply to ask these few questions is to find the official narrative, frankly, implausible. The more questions you pursue, it becomes more plausible that there's a different explanation. Namely, that elements within the top U.S. military intelligence and political leadership, which are closely intertwined, are complicit in what happened on September the 11th. Why U.S. complicity, you ask? Well, to stampede public opinion into supporting the so-called war on terrorism, to justify a war on Afghanistan for a future oil pipeline, the grab for Middle East oil and big budget increases for the military, and the general drive for global domination by the American empire. I know it sounds incredible, but Here's some historical context from this book, Body of Secrets. Its author is James Bamford. Bamford, until recently, was Washington investigative producer for ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. I learned of this book on ABC's website. Bamford's information comes from interviews with, for instance, the former dean of the U.S. intelligence community and from government documents. It takes 80 pages to list Bamford's more than 600 information sources. Here's the story. It's 1962. John F. Kennedy is U.S. President. Robert McNamara is Secretary of Defense. And Admiral Lyman Lemnitzer heads the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. The CIA has failed in its illegal Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. JFK decides, Bamford writes, to back away from military solutions to the Cuban problem. But Lemnitzer, the CIA, and others at the top remain obsessed with Cuba writes Bamford. As the Kennedy brothers appeared to suddenly go soft on Cuba, Lemnitzer could see his opportunity to invade quickly slipping away. Attempts to provoke the Cuban public to revolt seemed dead. Continues Bamford, Lemnitzer and the other chiefs knew there was only one option left that would ensure their war. They would have to trick the American public and world opinion. Lemnitzer comes up with Operation Northwoods. We could blow up a U.S. ship in Guantanamo Bay and blame Cuba. Casualty lists in U.S. newspapers would cause a helpful wave of national indignation. We could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. An elaborate variation. Create an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft. The duplicate would be loaded with selected passengers, all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. The actual registered aircraft will have been converted to a drone, a remotely controlled unmanned aircraft. The destruction of that aircraft will be triggered by radio signal. The Cubans would be blamed. Finally, another variation is described by Bamford. On February 20th, 1962, John Glenn was to lift off from Cape Canaveral on his historic journey. Lemnitzer proposed that should the rocket explode and kill Glenn, the objective is to provide irrevocable proof that the fault lies with Cuba by manufacturing various pieces of evidence which would prove electronic interference on the part of the Cubans. Thus, Bamford notes, as NASA prepared to send the first American into space, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were preparing to use John Glenn's possible death as a pretext to launch a war. The Operation Northwoods plan shows the Pentagon was capable, according to Bamford, 
of launching a secret and bloody war of terrorism against their own country in order to trick the American public into supporting a war on Cuba. Can we be sure, therefore, that complicity by the Pentagon in the events of September 11th is entirely out of the question? Next week, a more precise look at the events of that fateful day. And what about bin Laden? I'll have more on him, too, and the arrests of people named as terrorists around the world. A common explanation as to why no U.S. military interceptors took to the skies on September 11th until it was too late is that it was simple incompetence. Well, let me deal with the incompetence theory. First, by taking you back to October 26, 1999. That is the day the chartered Learjet carrying golfer Payne Stewart crashes, killing all on board. This from the National Transportation Safety Board crash report. 9.19 a.m., the flight departs. 9.24, the Learjet's pilot responds to an instruction from air traffic control. 9.33, the controller radios another instruction. No response from the pilot. For four and a half minutes, the controller tries to establish contact. Having failed, the controller calls in the military. Note that he did not seek, nor did he require, the approval of the President of the United States, or indeed anyone. Its standard procedure followed routinely to call in the Air Force when radio contact with a commercial passenger jet is lost, or the plane departs from its flight path, or anything along those lines occurs. 9.54, 16 minutes later, the F-16 reaches the Learjet at 46,000 feet and conducts a visual inspection. Total elapsed time, 21 minutes. So what does this prove? Well, it proves that standing routines exist for dealing with all such emergencies, for instance, loss of radio contact. All personnel in the air and on the ground are trained to follow the routines, which have been fine-tuned over decades as the Learjet incident illustrates. For large scheduled aircraft tracked throughout on radar to depart extravagantly from their flight paths would trigger numerous calls to the military, especially after two have hit the World Trade Center and now one is speeding toward Washington, D.C. It flies over the White House, turns sharply, and heads toward the Pentagon. Everyone, and I mean everyone, now knows these planes are very bad news. It's been reported on all TV networks for more than half an hour that this is a terrorist attack. Now, Andrews Air Force Base is a huge installation. It's home to Air Force One, the President's plane. It's home base for two combat-ready squadrons of jet interceptors mandated to ensure the safety of the U.S. Capitol. Andrews is only 12 miles from the White House. On September 11th, the squadrons there are the 121st Fighter Squadron of the 113th Fighter Wing, equipped with F-16s, and the 321st Marine Fighter Attack Squadron of the 49th Marine Air Group, Detachment A, equipped with F-A-18s. This information was on the website of the base on September 11th. On September 12th, Andrews chose to update its website, I find it odd that after the update, there's no mention of the F-16 and F-18 fighters. The base becomes, according to the website, home to a transport squadron only. Yet at 6.30 the evening of September 11th, NBC Nightly News, along with many outlets, reported, It was after the attack on the Pentagon that the Air Force then decided to scramble F-16s out of the D.C. National Guard Andrews Air Force Base, to fly a protective cover over Washington, D.C. Throughout the northeastern United States are many air bases, but that morning no interceptors respond in a timely fashion to the highest alert situation. This includes the Andrews squadrons, which have the longest lead time and are 12 miles from the White House. Whatever the explanation for the huge failure, there have been no reports to my knowledge of reprimands. This further weakens the incompetence theory. Incompetence usually earns reprimands. This causes me to ask, and other media need to ask, 
if there were stand-down orders. Next week, bin Laden was a longtime close ally of the CIA, according to the CIA itself. Why did he suddenly turn against them? Or did he? Stay tuned. Osama bin Laden is not an easy subject. Characterizations of him vary wildly. The most common, because it's the official narrative of cardboard cutout simplicity, is that he's the world's number one villain, the diabolical mastermind behind the events of September 11th. Another view, Osama is the conscience of Islam. Well, globally, Osama is like a Rorschach inkblot. His character and role morph into what various publics project upon him, based on what they're led to believe. Take books. There's an adage you can't tell a book by its cover. Maybe so, but you can tell it by its index. Bin Laden, the man who declared war on America, is by Yosef Bodansky, former senior consultant to the Pentagon and U.S. State Department. Bodansky explains a vast global conspiracy, it says in the foreword. The index entries on bin Laden in this 440-page book run almost two pages. But there are just four references to the CIA, mostly brief, and they reveal nothing. Yet the decades-long $8 billion CIA covert operation in Afghanistan was also its largest ever, according to numerous sources, including journalist John Cooley in his book, Unholy Wars, Afghanistan, America, and International Terrorism. Contrast the Badansky book with this one, Taliban, by Ahmed Rashid. He's a Pakistani journalist who's covered Afghanistan for 21 years. In his index are eight entries about bin Laden and 11 about the CIA. Now back to bin Laden. What do most sources agree on? We know bin Laden is born in Saudi Arabia in 1957. Okay, we're not sure about the year. His father becomes a close friend of the king and fabulously wealthy. Bin Laden Corporation becomes one of the largest construction companies in the Middle East. In this business, you're dealing with the Pakistani intelligence, the ISI, Saudi intelligence, the CIA. With his family's blessing, Osama becomes closely associated with the CIA in the Afghan war against the Soviets. Bin Laden Corp, Ahmed writes, built major training camps for the CIA. In 1986, he helped build the Coast Tunnel Complex, which the CIA was funding as a major arms storage depot, training facility, and medical center for the Mujahideen. At this point, bin Laden's story, like Stephen Leacock's horse, rides madly off in all directions. My questions. Did he turn against the CIA? Maintain ties while making anti-American statements? Was he manipulated? Former associates describe him as deeply impressionable, always in need of mentors, Rashid writes. You're forced to turn to a larger canvas. As in the final draft of this to-be-published book, The War on Freedom, Causes and Consequences of 9-11, by Nafiz Ahmed, Executive Director of the Institute for Policy Research and Development in Brighton, England. He's an Oxfam campaigner who specializes in writing international reports on human rights. News of his reports have been carried by Reuters, Associated Press, The Guardian, The Independent, The Jewish Chronicle, and The London Jewish News. Ahmed writes that bin Laden is merely a piece in a chess game. The stakes of the game are the last of the world's oil reserves and the Bush administration's consolidation of power to pursue a drastic, unlimited militarization of foreign policy on a massive and unprecedented scale required by long-standing elite planning while crushing domestic dissent and criminalizing legitimate protest. I believe that if we shrink from testing Ahmed's overview and accept only the headlines of the day, we will fail to see the forest for the trees. The USA helped recruit, train, and equip thousands of killer Mujahideen in the anti-Soviet war. Ahmed's book and other evidence shows the recruiting of and training of terrorists, including those in Al-Qaeda, has continued for years. The White House went underground with this aid. This is detailed in the 1993 book, The Outlaw Bank, A Wild Ride into the Secret Heart of BCCI. 
BCCI stands for Bank of Credit and Commerce International. It collapsed after exposure of its massive fraud and corruption. The book's authors are Jonathan Beatty and S.C. Gwynn. Beatty was an investigative reporter and senior correspondent for Time magazine. Gwynn, Time's economics editor and author of Selling Money. Further evidence of the long and deep involvement of the CIA in terrorism is found in the 1987 book, Crimes of Patriots, a true tale of dope, dirty money, and the CIA by Jonathan Quitney. Quitney, at the time, had been a Wall Street Journal reporter for 16 years. He wrote that neither the director of the CIA nor the deputy director had, in his career, shown any reluctance to shed American or foreign blood in covert military operations. The book details how some of the biggest names in American defense and intelligence were involved in an operation that promoted the dope trade, tax evasion, and gun running. Michael Springman is a Washington lawyer. He worked for the U.S. State Department's Foreign Service for 20 years. He spent two years as chief of the visa section at the U.S. consulate in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. He says superiors repeatedly ordered him to issue visas to unqualified applicants. It was illegal. He protested. He's just written this article in the reputable Covert Action Quarterly of Washington, D.C., and was interviewed by the CBC radio program Dispatches. I had not been protesting fraud. What I was protesting was, in reality, an effort to bring recruits, rounded up by the agency and Osama bin Laden, to the U.S. for terrorist training by the CIA. He details numerous cases. The State Department did not run the consulate in Jeddah. The CIA did. Of the roughly 20 Washington dispatch staff there, I know for a certainty that only three people, including myself, had no ties, either professional or familial, to any of the U.S. intelligence services. Now, what bugs me to no end is that mainstream media journalists function as if these books, written by the most professional in their own ranks, they function as if these books don't exist. Fellow journalists, the dots exist. For goodness sakes, connect them while you can. There are plenty of what we call in the news business pigs, solid current evidence, new dots. But these dots, past and present, are never connected. Take this November 22nd front page story in the Globe and Mail. I almost missed the startling information in this myself because the headline indulges a stereotypical Canadian self put down. Us stupid Canadians, we let a terrorist, one Ali Muhammad, get away. The real story is buried. Mr. Muhammad was a U.S. Army sergeant, but trained bin Laden's bodyguards. What? Ali Muhammad was in the Americans' good books. Ali Muhammad wasn't so shadowy in those days. He was one of their guys. The headline on this story might have read, USA protected top Al-Qaeda operative, and it might well have been the banner. Author Nafiz Ahmed's own conclusion is that the documentation strongly suggests the United States, or more precisely, significant elements of the U.S. government, military, and intelligence, had extensive foreknowledge of the 11th September attacks and were in various ways complicit in those attacks. All this and more must be considered when asking what really happened on September 11th. And where is bin Laden, you ask? Have journalists stopped asking? Why? Journalist and former Los Angeles Police Department detective Michael Rupert quipped recently, one guess is that he's in Switzerland having his nails done. Next week, George W. Bush and the oligarchy. Even among those who believe that the war on Afghanistan was part of the so-called war on terrorism, there's a fairly wide recognition that the outcome, the occupation of Afghanistan, might have something to do with the ambitions of U.S. oil corporations. Which brings us to the connection between September 11th and the oligarchy. Let me start with a crash course in globe oil reality, a framework little mentioned by the mainstream media. First, the size and power of big oil. Together, oil and coal constitute the biggest single industry in history, writes Ross Gelbspan in his book, 
the heat is on. Big oil alone does well over a trillion dollars a year in business. Second, we're at the end of the petroleum era. Total world oil extraction is peaking. These charts from Scientific American and other equally reliable sources tell the story. And the supply does not drop off gently. If you think this industry is rich and powerful now, wait till the supply is clearly on the wane. At the website www.dieoff.com, you can learn that in 1995, Petro Consultants published a report for oil industry insiders at $32,000 a pop titled World Oil Supply 1930 to 2050, which concludes that world oil extraction could peak as soon as the year 2000 and decline to half that level by 2025. Large and permanent increases in oil prices were predicted after the year 2000. Black gold is going to go platinum. Well, wait, we'll just switch to other energy sources, right? Wind, solar, biomass, tidal? Wrong. All the alternatives in the world, writes former U.S. Army officer and political analyst Stan Goff, cannot begin to provide more than a tiny fraction of the energy base now provided by oil. This makes it more than a resource and the drive to control what's left more than an economic competition. Most experts agree, writes Larry Chin in Online Journal, that the Caspian Basin and Central Asia are the keys to energy in the 21st century. Energy expert James Dorian in the Oil and Gas Journal, those who control the oil routes out of Central Asia will impact all future direction and quantities of flow and the distribution of revenues from new extraction. In other words, a pipeline through, of all places, Afghanistan, needed to carry an estimated $5 trillion worth of Caspian oil and gas reserves to markets. A significant detail that surely is not lost on those in power in the United States. So just who are these people? Let's start with the occupant of the Oval Office himself. George W. Bush was CEO of Harkin Energy. George Herbert Walker Bush, his dad and the former president, was an oil man. Now he's on the board of the Carlyle Group, which is heavily invested in oil and armaments. Dick Cheney was Secretary of Defense during Desert Storm. He stepped down to become CEO of Halliburton Oil, cashed in $34 million in Halliburton stock options before taking office as vice president. Donald Evans, Bush's Commerce Secretary, was with Colorado Oil. Zalmay Khalilzad is the Bush-appointed special envoy to Afghanistan. Khalilzad previously was an aide to the American oil company Unocal. He drew up Unocal's risk analysis on its proposed trans-Afghan gas pipeline. Khalilzad reports to Condoleezza Rice, Bush's national security advisor. When she was a board director of Chevron Corporation, she served as its principal expert on Kazakhstan where Chevron holds the largest concession of any of the international oil companies. Khalilzad will liaise with the new Afghani leader, Hamed Karzai, a former consultant to Unocal. You get the idea. A General Motors president once said, structure is strategy in slow motion. The structure of this cabinet shows, in my opinion, the primacy of oil interests. How does this connect with the events of 9-11? Well, it's hard to just invade a country out of the blue, I believe. The perfect pretext is a so-called war on terrorism, founded firmly so far upon the official narrative of what happened on September 11th. The psychological trick at the heart of September 11th, by the way, is that people confuse their compassion for the victims with their certainty about who the perpetrators are. The public was presented with instant perpetrators. The trick will most likely continue working for all future planned invasions, looks as if Iraq is next, so long as the public remains blindfolded by the media. 9-11 serves the ends of the oligarchy. That does not in itself prove a connection between big oil and what happened on September 11th. But the fact that it does serve those ends must be taken together with other evidence, just part of which is the illegal importation, training, and protection of terrorists on U.S. soil by the CIA, the much-publicized failure of U.S. intelligence, the failure of the U.S. Air Force on the day, 
the inexplicable trades of United and American Airlines stocks in the days prior, the big economic difficulties the Bush administration was facing, and the looming Enron scandal. Next week, The Great Deception, Part 5. September 11th has brought mostly unpleasant changes, including curtailment of civil liberties and threatened perpetual war, all rooted in the official story of what happened on September 11th. Namely, that one evil man and his network are responsible, and that the U.S. military intelligence and military intelligence and political establishments were all caught totally off guard. Millions of intelligent people accept this story as their own, Any argument about any aspect of the conduct of the war against terrorism, as Globe and Mail columnist John Ibbotson puts it, must begin with those airplanes smashing into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And then it must stay there and never move from that spot. If it's that important, and I agree it is, then it's the duty of the media and of intelligent citizens to inquire about any anomalies about September 11th. Today's question... What did George Bush know, and when did he know it, on September 11th? Bush was first informed of the suicide attacks at an education event in Florida, his face creasing into anxiety. The crisis transformed his presidency. This image, embedded in the official story, has led the world to believe that when Bush's chief of staff, Andrew Card, whispered into his ear at an elementary school at 9.05 that morning, It was the first the U.S. president learned that, in his words, America was under attack. But a growing number of people, including the careful researchers at emperorsclothes.com, don't think so. Using verifiable, publicly available information, Ilarion Baikov and Jared Israel, an intrepid Canadian, raise questions mainstream media stubbornly refuse to even acknowledge. Consider, Baikov and Israel say, the words of journalist John Cochran, who was traveling with the president on the morning of September the 11th, on an ABC special report. Cochran is speaking to Peter Jennings. Peter, as you know, the president's down in Florida talking about education. He got out of his hotel suite this morning, was about to leave. Reporters saw the White House chief of staff, Andy Card, whisper into his ear. The reporter said to the president, do you know what's going on in New York? He said he did, and he said he will have something about it later. His first event is about half an hour at an elementary school in Sarasota, Florida. So Bush knew, writes Emperor's Clothes, about the first incident before leaving his hotel. Take other evidence. By 8.20, according to its own official report, the Federal Aviation Authority, the FAA, is fully aware of the unprecedented emergency in the skies. As Baikov and Israel point out, the President of the United States travels with an entire staff, including the Secret Service, which is responsible for his safety. The members of this support team have the best communications equipment in the world. They maintain contact with, or can easily reach, Bush's cabinet, the National Military Command Center and Pentagon, the FAA. In other words, around 846 at the absolute latest, the Secret Service and the President would have known of all four hijacked airliners and that one had hit the World Trade Center. That's two sets of proofs that question the famous whisper in the ear at 9.05. Still not convinced? How about the typically garbled words of the President himself? From the transcript of a town hall session in Orlando, Florida on December the 4th. Jordan, a third grader. How did you feel when you heard about the terrorist attack? Applause. The President. Thank you, Jordan. Well, Jordan, I was sitting outside the classroom waiting to go in, and I saw an airplane hit the tower. The TV was obviously on. And I used to fly myself, and I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. But I was whisked off there. I didn't have much time to think about it. And I was sitting in the classroom, and Andy Card, my chief of staff, walked in and said, a second plane has hit the tower. America is under attack. And Jordan, I wasn't sure what to think at first. Wait a minute. The president tells us he saw the incredible image of the first plane going in. He went ahead with an easily cancelable appointment. Why? He tells us he knew his country was under attack, yet 
he continued to listen to a student talk about her pet goat and such for another 25 minutes. Why? Where can you find that town hall transcript? On the White House website. Thanks to a viewer on the West Coast for drawing it to my attention. In other words, no matter how you cut it, George W. Bush is acting right here. There are many other facts equally puzzling, at least for anyone still clinging to the official story of 9-11. His schedule and whereabouts had been publicly announced. Why did the Secret Service not whisk him away for safety's sake? Do you think there's anything here that mainstream media should follow up? Have you noticed any such follow-up? Do you find this as incredible as I do? What will it take to snap people out of the hypnotic trance of the official story and start asking questions? Maybe you calling an editor and raising hell. Until the world finds out the truth about what really happened on September the 11th, the world is held hostage to the so-called war on terrorism. And surely it's time to recognize that for what it is, harsh final steps to what the U.S. military terms full-spectrum dominance. Next week, the final installment of The Great Deception, moral and spiritual challenges that arise amidst fear and denial in a propagandized society. And that brings me to the conclusion of my series, The Great Deception. The editors at the New York Times made the right judgment call, in my opinion, by playing this story at the top of their front page recently. Because government deception is a moral issue. But in a way, these headlines are laughable by including phrases such as readies efforts and proposes to send false news. Are readers supposed to believe the Pentagon might start lying? The Pentagon was caught lying about the thousands of civilian deaths in Panama in 1989. The U.S. military said 250 civilians were killed. I mean, there isn't a credible source in Panama that believes that's true. Whether it's ambulance drivers, human rights monitors, people, doctors who worked in hospitals, neighbors of bombed out uh, blocks, it's just clearly false. That story would be so easy to tell for any journalist worth his or her salt, but they're not telling it. Back to the Times article. The odd thing about it is that you can go over it with a divining rod and find that neither the writers nor anyone they quote makes so much as a passing reference to the simple wrongness of government lying. Not once are the words moral, morality, ethics, or such used, let alone lies or lying. In my moral book, publishing a story with morality at its heart without mentioning the word is committing the sin of omission. The story also accepts foolish statements about Saddam Hussein and prints them with a straight face, as it were. It's claimed he has a charm offensive going on. I don't know about you, but I've noticed the offensive part, but not the charm part. And we haven't done anything to counteract it, a senior military official said. Well, if you don't count the U.S. government's all-out propaganda campaign against the Iraqi leader for more than a decade, then I guess this guy's got a point. Readers are also misled to focus on side issues, such as public perceptions, strategy, possible illegality, and bureaucratic turf wars. This article, representing the creme de la creme of U.S. journalism, symbolizes how disconnected the U.S. media and government have become from moral questions, one might almost say from reality. To give credit where credit's due, the Times ran an editorial terming the Pentagon's proposed new Office of Strategic Influence Orwellian. Yet, the editorial fails as well to question the fundamental justness of the Pentagon. Which brings me to my main point. The less people ask themselves questions about deceit, the more it clears the way for organizations such as the CIA to continue to receive seemingly unending billions of dollars, taxpayer money used to train terrorists, as the CIA acknowledges it has, to destabilize governments, as former CIA agent John Stockwell writes in his book, 
in search of enemies and to inject toxic gray, white, and black propaganda into the world's information systems, as William Bloom spells out in Killing Hope, all with barely a whisper of dissent. The lie, wrote theologian Andre Duma, is biblically portrayed as the first and most poisonous source of injustice. Truth-telling, he wrote, is absolutely essential to the very life and health of the whole community which is at the heart of the great deception about what really happened on September 11th. For the past five weeks, I've asked questions. How could it be that no U.S. Air Force jet interceptors turned a wheel on September the 11th until it was too late? Is it coincidence that the war on Afghanistan triggered by September 11th will clear the way for petroleum pipelines of huge interest to the White House? How to explain the virtual non-reaction of President Bush immediately following the planes slamming into the World Trade Center. These marked-up passages are from my dog-eared copy of a gem of a book, The Idea of Disarmament, Rethinking the Unthinkable, by Alan Geyer. Geyer, in 1982, writes, The nuclear arms race has become this generation's severest test of truth. It is zealously promoted with false words deceptive jargon, pretentious dogmatics, hateful propaganda, and arbitrary bars on access to the truth. No realm of public policy is more corrupted by untruthful speech than national security. Today, the big lie of the so-called war on terrorism, itself firmly based on the linchpin of the implausible official version of what happened on September 11th, is an even more severe test of truth in my opinion. Under the banner of the war on terrorism, George W. Bush, with the aid of the media, zealously promotes perpetual global war in service of resource looting and permanent popularity for himself. There's unprecedented militarism. The USA is spending more than half its budget on wars past, present, and future, according to the Center for Defense Information. As Christian humanist Geyer writes, in words truer today, in my view, than when written. Demythologizing has become the indispensable theological tool of peacemaking. It is the operation empowering the people of God to understand the stratagems by which inhuman speech violates the word of God. Those stratagems include a relentless outpouring of myths about weapons, strategy, security, enemies, history, and human nature, from government bureaucracies and adjunct think tanks and co-opted media and electronic theologians. And in this gem of a book, I find the perfect conclusion to this series about what really happened on September 11th, about the great deception, about moral and spiritual challenges amidst fear and denial. In the 1930s, there was a powerful peace movement. At that time, a play by Viennese poet Stefan Zweig was produced. The play's principal character, Jeremiah, bursts forth with these words. Peace is not a thing of weakness. It calls for heroism and action. Day by day you must wrest it from the mouths of liars. You must stand alone against the multitude, for clamor is always on the side of the many, and the liar has ever the first word. The meek must be strong.